I came to this country when I was four years old with my family. Nelly Galan is a self-made media mogul. I'm a kid of immigrants, and I figured my parents did not bring me all this way for me not to do something big. She started out as the youngest guest editor of Seventeen magazine, which led her to reporting for network television. At 22, she became the country's youngest television station manager. Galan founded her own company, Galan Entertainment, in 1994, which helped launch over 10 television channels abroad and produced over 700 television shows in English and Spanish, including the hit reality series The Swan for Fox Network, which was famously spoofed on Saturday Night Live. Galan became the first Latina president of a U.S. Telemundo. She then was a celebrity apprentice. Television executive and Latina media tycoon, Nelly Galan. The Spanish word for expert. Empresario. I love that word. Empresario. I love that word. Who likes empresario? Right? Nelly is a leader. I live in the world of Latinos, in the world of successful women. And somebody has to do it. Milan has since started the Adelante movement to unite and empower Latinas economically and entrepreneurially. I decided I'm going to start a movement for Latinas and it's called the Adelante movement because Adelante means move it, move forward. The media and the U.S. government took notice. My charity is for women entrepreneurs. Here with us now, Emmy Award-winning producer Nelly Galan. I wanted to say to American companies, if you're not looking for Latinas in your corporation, you're missing the boat. Our goal is to train as many Latinas as we can. Well, you could see her excitement. I'm excited. Adelante. <laughs> Thank you for teaching me a new word, Adelante. I will definitely work that into my yep, daily vocabulary. We're now going to go to our next panel, which is going to be led by Nellie Galan. If women in general are given the tools, America's best days are truly ahead. You are so positive, and you, you give people this incredible feeling that they can do and be anything. Right. I but I love, love their slogan. Around. You know what her slogan is? Don't buy shoes, buy buildings. Nellie has done it all. She is a inspiring entrepreneur. And now Nellie has a new book out, Self Made, about entrepreneurship for all women. The new goal is to become self-made. Let me show you how. Now, here, go. Adelante. I'm so happy to be with Etsy because I buy so much from all of you. I'm going broke from Etsy. So I can't wait to meet some of you and find out who have I been buying from. As you know, I just wrote this book, Self Made, and I say to you with total power and total humility, I am self made. And I'm so proud to be with all of you because all of you are self made and becoming self made. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about my journey because I always love when you watch people's tapes and you go, well, that sounds really good, but we know the story is not as good as it looks, right? And so I wanted to let you know, how did that story happen? How did I end up running a network, having my own company, and becoming self-made, coming from immigrant parents who came to this country when I was five with no money, came with the shirt off their backs. I had to be their translator. It was a very traumatic. How many people here are immigrants? Anybody immigrant in the audience? So you understand and you relate. So I want you all to know that it started when I was 13 years old. And my parents had sent me to all-girl Catholic high school. That's the problem to begin with. <laughs> and we were going through another bad economy in this country, and I would hear my parents at night. And you know, like kids of immigrants always are worried about their parents. And I would hear my parents saying, what are we going to do? We cannot pay for the school. And my father would say to my mom, don't worry, Jesus will help us. 
And I kept, you know, like, here I am in my own bedroom going, oh my God, if Jesus doesn't help us, the nun's going to call me to the office. It's going to be embarrassing. And this lady down the street had said to me, honey, I sell Avon. You want to sell some Avon? And then you can have some free lipstick or whatever. And I thought, I got to go talk to this lady and cut a better deal. And I went to her and I said, listen, forget the free lipstick. I'll sell Avon 50-50. I'd seen it on a TV show. <laughs> and so I started selling Avon. And in the first week in my school, out of my locker, I made 200 bucks. <laughs> I'm good. I could be a very good Etsy seller. And imagine, in those days, there was no digital. I had to do it, you know, I had to talk to each person one by one. So after one month, I was able to pay my tuition. But I thought to myself, oh my God, if my father finds out, he's not, like my father's a macho Latino. So what I did is I, said, I went to the nuns and I said, look, you've got to write a letter home saying that I got some kind of scholarship or something. And so I brought the letter home to my parents and that night my mother goes, ¿Qué dice esta carta? What does it say? And my father goes, oh my God, your daughter is a genius and Jesus helped us after all. <laughs> and so that was the beginning of my entrepreneurial bug. But a, a few things had to happen before that. And I think so many of us, and I'm sure all of you relate to this, I think the entrepreneurial spirit oftentimes become, comes from a place of pain. Something goes wrong in your life. I had a series of bad things that turned out well, and I'll tell you what they are. After that, in my sophomore year in high school, at the same school, the nuns, clearly I have issues with nuns. This, this one nun said to me, I, you wrote a story for school. I don't think you really wrote the story. So she accused me of plagiarism. And I went home to my parents and I said, I got suspended for three days for plagiarizing. And they go, oh my God, ask for forgiveness. I go, but I didn't do anything. And I decided I was so mad at this nun that I called the head of the Board of Education of the, of the state of New Jersey, where I grew up. And this African-American guy answered, thank God for him, because he was empowered. And I said, are these nuns, you know, can they do this to me? Can they, can they, and he goes, well, you can say whatever you want. You can, you know, freedom of speech. So I write this article to Seventeen Magazine about why you should never send your kid to all-girl Catholic school. <laughs> and I send it in. Three days later, uh, the nun says, I'm so sorry. I thought it was an Ernest Hemingway story. I guess it was a compliment, right? She goes, I checked it out, and you, you really wrote it, so you're back. OK, so I go on with my life. Everything's fine. Three months later, I get a $100 check in the mail from 17. That's how I ended up at 17. You'll see how it happened. A hundred dollar check and they were publishing your article. And I'm like, no, oh no. And I go to all the newsstands and I try, I mean, I don't even have any money and I'm trying to buy the magazines. I go to school that day and all the girls are like, because all the girls read 17 Magazine. We didn't have digital back then. And I get called to the principal's office. Like, I guess this is a theme. First I'm worried I'm going to get called because we don't have money for the school and now it's because I did something bad. And I'm such a goody two-shoes, by the way. I go into the principal's office, and she's like, oh my god, we don't like your kind here. What have you done? And she kind of told me off in only a way a nun could do. And the way I interpreted what she said to me is she was expelling me. So I leave there, and I'm like crying hysterically. And I go home to my parents, and I go, Ay, Dios mío, I got expelled from the school. We told you, don't, why do you have to do these things? Go back on your hands and knees and apologize. <laughs> and once again, I go, but I didn't do anything wrong. So I call the guy from the board of ed. <laughs> and I go, can this nun, again, before they, t they, you know, they told me that they were gonna suspend me. Now I, they're expelling me. He's like, well, it's a private school. They can expel you if you want. But you know what you can do? Let's get a reporter from your local newspaper. <laughs> can you tell him a little impulsive? I go and I interview with the newspaper, and the next day comes out in the local paper, Cuban girl gets expelled for First Amendment issue. <laughs> oh my god. And my parents, OK, anybody that has immigrant parents know, we're like very we try to stay under the radar. I mean, I don't know what it is. It's like they won't, don't anybody know we're here? You know, it's very weird. My parents are freaking out, and the nun calls me. 
I, I want your entire family here today. The worst car ride of my life to that school. My parents barely spoke English. My mother's like, why are you making me speak English? Now I have to be insulted by a nun in English. <laughs> so we go to the school, and this is the shocker that happened. We walk in, and the nun's like, super nice. And she's like, I didn't expel you. I never said you were expelled. I just said I was unhappy. You're such a good student. In fact, you're such a good student. You're such an APA student. We're going to graduate you early. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. And then I get a call from Seventeen Magazine, and they were thrilled, because we know publicity, right? They were like, oh my god. I mean, if I was living in today's time, I would have been Malala. <laughs> I would have gotten so much stuff going on over that First Amendment issue, right? So Seventeen called me, and they go, we have a guest edit editorship for a college junior. We're going to give it to you, your high school junior, and we're going to give it to you, the youngest guest editor ever in our magazine's history. And my entire life changed. And I think I could not have been an entrepreneur if I didn't learn the lesson that being a wimp doesn't pay. That, in, that we think that when we do something that gets publicity or that rocks the boat or that does something, that it's a negative. But in fact, to speak up, to choose yourself, is what makes a self-made person. So I think that was the second piece of the puzzle. And then the third piece of the puzzle is what clinched it. Years later, I went on, as you heard in the tape, I, worked in, I started working in television because my articles in 17 were found by a young, a there was a teenage version of 60 Minutes being produced. And you saw me looking very young with, with a unibrow, interviewing people. So my whole life changed. I would not have dreamed the life I ended up having in media if, all, if I had not written that article for school. I mean, think about that, weird. And if I hadn't fought for myself and spoken up for myself. So years later, I ended up at 22 running a little rinky-dinky TV station in New Jersey, right across from, from New York. Um, and it, I worked for these two very wealthy guys who recruited me and were like, you're Latina, we're starting a TV station, it's going to have Spanish content, and, and I went to work for them. And it was like getting an MBA on the job. I ran this little station, it was amazing. I worked like a dog, like all of us do, right? People that are sellers, people that, that have this mindset, we work very hard. And I worked there for three years, and one day I come into work, and the lawyer for the company goes, I have great news for you. We sold the company. I go, oh my god, what do you mean you sold the company? I didn't know the company was for sale. And I was so mad. Not because of the money. I didn't even think about that. I just thought, this is my baby. You know how we are, right? I ran into New York City, and I came to see one of my bosses. who was a, At the time, was a multimillionaire. Now he's a billionaire. And I went to him and I said, how could you do this to me? Why didn't you tell me the company was for sale? This is my baby. He goes, stop. He goes, young lady, those are my chips. If you think you're so good, go get your own chips. And I was like, what, an, ah, what a jerk. Why would he say that to me? And I left again crying. You're not supposed to cry. I always say I'm very tough, but I cry a lot. I left there and I went home and I'm like, my baby is going to be taken from me. And then I said, wait a minute. I'm not any, that guy's not smarter than me. I just ran his business, and he just sold it for a lot of money. I go, why can't I do what he does? And I changed my whole mindset, and I got mad. And then I go, I'll show him. I am never going to work for anyone again. And I was living in New York City, in Central Park West, and at the time, a $3,500 a month apartment that I shared with one of my friends from high school. Can you imagine now it would be like 7,000? And I said, he had said to me once, when I was your age, I started a business. I lowered my overhead. So what did I do? I moved to the East Village, which is now very expensive, but back then, I lived there in a fourth floor walk-up, $300 a month rent control apartment, which is now a condo for a million dollars, by the way. It was sold for a million dollars. Imagine, $300 a month, a studio. And I said, I'm starting a business. So what happened to me? I didn't know what the heck I was doing. So for four years, I did not make a penny. 
I took side jobs. I was a stringer for CBS. I did every odd job. I worked at the Limited. I mean, I did everything. And you can imagine the Latino parents. Ay, Dios mío, por favor, find a husband. You're going to lose your looks. What is this entrepreneur? Por favor, get over it. And then my friends are like, dude. By the way, back then, not to age myself, it wasn't that cool to be an entrepreneur. Now it's very cool. My friends were like, dude, can't you get a job? Like, what's up with you? Like, what are you doing? But I didn't give up. And this is one of the, the key things I want to talk to you about later. What happened? I realized that something was wrong. I didn't know what it was, but I was you know, going to see people. I was very energetic. I had a business plan. I did all these things. And everybody was like, they would offer me jobs, but they wouldn't fund me. And I realized I, something was wrong. So I joined my local chamber of commerce. I joined this organization at the time called YEO, which was Young Entrepreneur Organization. I started asking people for help. And I realized that something was a little off in my business model. And I did what we now would say is a pivot. I changed it a little bit. And in the fourth year, again, when everybody was freaking out, I thought to myself, well, my boss once told me, when he told me to lower my overhead, he said, when I was your age, I started a business. For 10 years, I didn't make money, and then I became a billionaire. A millionaire. Now he's a billionaire. And I thought, well, I'm only on year four. So I have to hang in there. And I think to myself, if I didn't have that as a role model, I would have given up. And so many people give up. In the fourth year, I got help. I pivoted slightly. And within a year, I had multi-million dollars of contracts. And I have never looked back. I started a business. I later sold that business. I went back to working in a corporation because I got offered a job that I couldn't resist to be the first Latina woman president of a network. I thought even my parents would get that. They didn't really, because I didn't have a kid then yet, so that's all they cared about. And I've had all of the ups and downs that all of you have in entrepreneurship. But in 2008, I get a call from NBC, and after producing a lot of shows for NBC and for other people, The Swan, which I don't know if many of you saw, and in 2008, I got a call to be on Celebrity Apprentice. And I was, and mm, we can, you can ask me questions about that later. <laughs> I'm sure, you notice we had Celebrity Apprentice and the Clinton Foundation and Hillary Clinton. So we have a lot to talk about. Okay. So I go on Celebrity Apprentice. I mean, the NBC says to me, we need a Latina that kicks butt. We need somebody who can really speak up to Donald Trump because he likes to argue with people. And by then, I had had six billionaire clients who had all yelled at me, who had all screamed at me. So I was used to screaming back and saying, I'm not going to let you talk to me that way. And so by the time Donald Trump came along, it was like child's play. I come off of that show, and women started calling me from America, especially a lot of multicultural women going, how did you speak to, who are you? What have you done that you know how to speak to Donald Trump that way? And in 2008, right after that show, after Donald Trump made me famous, I mean, it's amazing, the economy crashes. And I was producing a lot of television shows, and all of them got frozen. And you can imagine that we all get scared. We all think everything is going to go away at any moment, right? And I went into my scary cat thing. But here is the thing that I did right. In all those years making TV shows and making money, I still lived beneath my means. I took all the money I made and I bought little buildings from my company and then little buildings around the company. And everybody says to me, well, how did you? I, I started with $5,000. So nobody can, there's no one that can tell me you can't do it. And I bought these buildings. And by then, all my buildings were rented. And so my husband said to me, why are you freaking out? You're still thinking like an immigrant. You don't, I was in my early 40s and he's like, you don't have to work another day in your life. I go, what? That can't be true. He's like, no. Your buildings are all rented, and you are a landlord, and you have money. And so what I did is, in, in that moment, he said to me, what would you want to do if you were going to die in a year? If you knew you were going to die in a year, what would you regret that you didn't do? And I said, I never finished college. And so I want you all to know that not all of us have linear paths. 
You know, we have things that happen. I'm the kid of an immigrant. I always felt like I had to make money and help my parents first. And so I went back to school. I took a sabbatical from my company. I went back to school for four years and got a master's and doctorate in clinical psychology. So I can be all your shrinks. <laughs> and while I was in school, I had time to think. And I noticed that in psychology school, so many women are pathologized. Like, we talk a lot in psychology school about all the issues women have. And I started noticing that after the bad economy, women were rising up in entrepreneurship, particularly multicultural women. And so I wrote my dissertation on how entrepreneurship is kind of an answer for women's problems. Because once you have your own money, I mean, how can you be empowered if you're not taking charge of your own life and your own finances and your own financial well-being? And coming off of that, I thought, I have to go help my own community because Latinas are the fastest growing entrepreneurs and they need my help because I'm an entrepreneur in spades. And so I started going around the country really training women in entrepreneurship and so many other women started showing up. Women from all cultures that had nowhere to go. And then white women that were saying, how do we reach these communities of consumers that are African American and Latino and Asian? And so together, we've been, I've been working for four years. I've met over 150,000 women. And so many men have shown up too, because guess what? You're going to find out that there's all this hidden money in America that's earmarked for women. So if you really want to make money, partner with a woman. That's what I'm going to tell you. So in this long journey, of my life with these, all these detours and all these different things, what have I learned? I really want to share with you my learnings because I wish somebody had told me all this stuff. The number one thing I've learned is that to become self-made, if, if, if becoming self-made is a race, the starting point of the race, at least for me, and I know for so many other women, is you have to realize there is no Prince Charming. In fact, we have to kill the notion of Prince Charming. And what do I mean by that? And this is true for guys too. We all, whether we admit it or not, women may be more than men, but even men, we still think someone is going to save us. Whether it's a mate, whether it's a boss, whether it's a corporation, whether it's the government or the president of the United States. And what I've learned in my journey is no one's going to save me and that I have everything it takes to do it myself. I have a son who's here, 16 years old, and I, when, when he was a little boy, I realized my relationship with his dad wasn't gonna work. And so I became a single mom, and I started to panic, and I go, how am I gonna do this? And even though I was a successful woman already, but again, living in, a, in, a, in an environment where it was my own company, you have ups and downs. And I remember sitting with a girlfriend of mine and saying, how am I going to raise this kid by myself? How am I going to do it financially? And she goes, are you kidding me? You're freaking Prince Charming. You're it. And when she said that to me, I thought, oh my god, she's right. I can do this. And the next three years of my life, with my son as my guiding light, I made more money the next three years than I had ever made in my life. And so when you really realize, and I know so many of you have already gone through this, because if you're here, and if you're a seller, you already know that you've had to take control of your life. But I think that's an important thing that is ongoing. We have to remind ourselves over and over again, because every once in a while, somebody shows up and you go, oh my god, they get me, and they're going to help me, and this and that. And, and it's a false notion. No, I can do this for myself. I'm going to get it. And you constantly have to grow and keep going so that, you can, so that you can do it for yourself. I think the next thing that I wish somebody had told me and that I've had to really learn is that I've had to make fear and failure my best friends. People say to me all the time, you're so fearless, you do all these things. I mean, I just wrote a New York Times best-selling book. If I had known before I did it <laughs> that it was so hard, maybe I wouldn't have done it. And fear does show up all the time for me. I'm not fearless. But I've, I've learned that fear is not a fact. It's just a feeling. The meditation I have is I think of myself in an airplane, and there's a cloud. I see the cloud in the window. And there's, you know, begin, there begins to be like the plane shaking, right? And I, I get scared. And then I just breathe through it, and I go, OK, 
We're gonna pass through this cloud and then it gets calm. And that's the way life is. Fear shows up for me every day and when it does, I go, this too shall pass. And in fact, if fear shows up, it's telling me what I have to do. And I have to do it anyway, because the fear is not real. And then let's talk about failure. You know, my tape of my successes looks good. My failure resume would be 10 times longer. I have failed so many times that I can't even tell you in my personal life. So many, how, many, how many of you have gone out with the worst guys in the world and you go, why? Why did I do that? <laughs> fail, fail, fail. And in my business life, in order to have, you know, I've produced 700 shows, three have been huge hits, and that's like a, a great, you know, three out of 700 is really good. The rest of them are meat and potatoes. Not everything we do works. But I can tell you truthfully that when I fail, I cry a lot, I mourn, I even sleep it out. And every single time I get up and around the corner from my worst failures are my greatest successes. And you know, I, I'm, the, I'm blessed that I know, does everybody here know who Rita Moreno is? Okay, so for the youngins that don't, she was in West Side Story and she won an Oscar. She's very big for people that are, that are my age. And she wrote a book, so I'm not saying anything that she hasn't said publicly. She was madly in love with Marlon Brando when she was young, and she was all about men, right? And she actually, he, he breaks up with her and marries another girl, and she's so depressed that she tries to kill herself. And Marlon Brando's assistant found her and saved her life. And one of the, I love this story because she says, you know, I thought life was over. And she said, two months later, I get cast in this movie, and I go, oh, I'm not even into it. It's probably a piece of junk. And she goes, and she's in West Side Story. And a year later, she wins the Academy Award. And she says, here I was thinking that I was a failure over a guy. Ay, Dios mio. <laughs> and she said, and I, if I didn't live through that, I, I wouldn't have gotten my Academy Award. And I feel, I always think about her because it is so true in my own life. Around my biggest failures personally and in business, around the corner, something comes along and I go, oh my God, and I pursue something and it works. And it's huge. I think I wish somebody had said to me that to be chosen, we all think somebody's gonna choose us, but in fact, we have to choose ourselves first. When I go and I talk to women and I say, what is it that you do? well, you know, I'm really good at putting outfits together. So are you a stylist? If you don't say what you are, if, you know, when I tell women, they say, oh, you know, I really like to cook. And I go, so are you a chef or can you cook? If you don't tell me you're a chef, how can I cast you in Master Chef? I think we diminish ourselves. We say things about ourselves. You know, I, I'm curious to hear if all of you see yourselves as self-made. Do you see yourselves as entrepreneurs? Because I find that a lot of women will say to me, I'm a, you know, I freelance and I do this on the side and I sell on the side. No, you are self-made, you're an entrepreneur. If you don't declare yourself, how is anyone going to help you? Or how is anyone going to say, oh my God, I know this thing for you. And so I wish someone had said that to me sooner. I also think it's, I say to people, don't buy shoes, buy buildings. And I say that as a metaphor. I mean, in my case, I really did buy buildings versus shoes. But I think we have to ask ourselves, when we do make money, do we still then, are we still spending more money than we make? Are we buying things we don't really need? In your case, you know, we, lucky for all of you, you know you can buy anything and resell it, so it's not such a big problem. <laughs> and in fact, that's one of the things I tell everybody, your house, is a store of unsold merchandise. Everything is up for sale. <laughs> so I think all of these things are very important. I also think it's important to say that power is taken, not given. Things are not gonna come to you on a silver platter. You gotta go get them. And so I, wanna think, I want you to think about that. Where in your life are you not taking your power? And I think these are all things that I wish somebody had said to me, Am I, is my microphone gone? Okay, there it is. I also wish somebody had said to me, when I meet women around the country and they, and I say, and they go, 
I can't do what you did. You don't know what's happened to me. Some horrible things happened to me. And I say, in your pain is your brand. I want you to really hear that. I believe that the bad things that happen to us, no matter how horrible, can be turned into profit because you are an expert in that pain. You can look in that pain and say, what was missing for me? What's the hole for other people that had that happen to them? You know, I've made a lot of money making shows about kids of immigrants, because I'm an expert at that. That's my pain. So I want you all to think, what is your pain, and are you really going into your pain instead of running away from it? Because there's a customer base for your pain that has the same thing that happened to you happen to them. And how can you fill that for them? So I want to tell you that my goal today, and what I'm giving you like a reader's digest of the book, is I want all of you to have a rich life in every way. And I'm going to show, oh, it's up. Thank you. And the reason I say that is because for all of us, I know that people that do what we do, it's not just all about money. It is, but money alone doesn't make you happy. But I will tell you this, money buys you freedom and it allows you to truly follow your bliss. I love how in this country we tell everybody, follow your bliss and the money will come. Oh my God, that's such BS. <laughs> I mean, and it's kind of an entitled first world point of view. If you're a girl in Afghanistan and you want to be a singer, is that, are you going to make money off of that? Not necessarily. So I think we have to think in a more balanced way. But I, when I say a rich life in every way, I mean rich in love, rich in family, and rich in abundance. Because if we're not abundant, we can't make the rest of it happen. And I, and I want to show us how to do it tactically. So how do we create a rich life? And this is kind of, I know for all of you, I think we all think this way already because you wouldn't be here if you don't think this way. But we have to remind ourselves of this. That to be, to have a rich life, you have to change your mindset from instant gratification to long-term and goal orientation. And I think that is a big issue in this country. We all want everything now and we can buy everything now. And while we're sellers, we don't want to go crazy and buy everything that we don't need. And we want to think, to ground us in what we're doing and what is our intention and what do we want, we have to create big goals. So let's talk about this. How do we create big goals? Because I'm telling you, when I talk to people around the country, and particularly women, the goals are very small. I mean, think about it. I just wrote a New York Times book. I decided, not only am I going to write a book, I'm going to write a New York Times best-selling book. That's a big goal. That was really hard to do. That is like climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. But I can do it because I declared it. I wrote it down. I have a vision board. That's what I want. And I've done that for everything in my life. So how do we figure out our goals truly? You start at the end of your life and you work your way backwards. And youngins, this is good for you because you have a long way to go and you have time to do it all. But it's, you can do this at any time of your life. You start with someone that's 85 years old. You look at someone in your life that you know that's 85 and say, do I, is her life what I want? Does she have enough money to have medical insurance? Or is her family having to take care of her? Did she figure out her life correctly? And you work your way backwards. Look at someone that's 60. Look at someone that's 50. If you're 20, look at someone that's 30, someone that's 40. And look at good role models and bad role models and find out how they did it. And if it's somebody famous, read everything about them. But you have to know that the goal is not just about today, not just about making money to go on vacation this week, but to sustain you over a lifetime, to create a rich life, not a rich year, not a rich month, not we're going to go sell like crazy to make it to Christmas. It's long-term thinking. It's strategic. It's a business plan for your life. So how do we do this? You're going to set those goals. You're going to say, that old lady doesn't own her own house. And like I had a neighbor, she was living in a house, and the house was worth $2 million, but she was living inside of it like a homeless person because she didn't sell the house in time. 
and didn't plan her old age. So what are the things that when you see this, you decide that you want? For me, it was like, I want my own business. I want to be a millionaire. I don't think people, women sometimes are almost embarrassed to say that. I want to be a millionaire. I want to work because I want to and not because I have to. That's my way of saying retired because I'm never retiring. But I want, to, I want to really follow my bliss. Guess what? I couldn't follow my bliss till I could work because I want to and not because I have to. I want to go back to school and pay for the best education I can pay for, and I want to send my kid to college. Because when I was a teenager, I had to make money for my family. I want my parents to never have to worry about money ever again because they're immigrants. I want to take myself on a trip around the world, which I did. But I didn't, along the way, spend so much money that by the, by, by the way, when you're 20, you can schlep around Europe for $100 a day. When you're 50, hell no. <laughs> so you need more money as you get older. So I want you to think about, do you really have goals for a lifetime? And they keep, by the way, you keep changing as you get older. In my case, I got to all my goals till I, by the time I was 45. I had to create new goals. Oi, I picked a New York Times bestselling book. You know, I, I keep climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, but the truth of the matter is, that's the point. If you visualize it, if you write it down, you actually accomplish ahead of schedule. Amazing. By the way, we can send you all this PowerPoint that you could write all over. FYI, just ask Etsy. Okay, how do we do this? How do we now take these goals and make them come alive and make them happen? You create a self-made mindset of mission and money. So think of mission as your bliss. What is it that you like to do? We know we don't always make money at what we like to do. But we have skills that can make us money. Obviously, everyone here has sales skills, which I love. OK? So we have to live life. It's not follow your bliss and the money will come. It's mission and money. And money comes first. And money will help buy you your mission any way you want it. So I don't say don't do what you love and don't keep that on track. But in my life, I can tell you that not always have mission and money aligned. Sometimes my life has been more about money. So, and, and, and mission has come very big into play once I had made money. Because then I went full blown into mission. But along the way, I kept mission alive. I kept mission alive. But it wasn't all about the mission. So it's, there's nothing wrong with making money and making sure that you really focus on it, particularly when you have the most life force. Do three things. You know, I tell women, which you guys are already doing, so I love it, get a side hustle. Don't leave your job. Get a, you guys have a side hustle, and some of you have turned your side hustle into your business, which is amazing. Maybe you have three side hustles because we all have to plan for the future. In a, in, and by the way, thank God we had the 2008 crash because we know that there's no financial Prince Charming either. I, that come from a communist country, can tell you, I grew up, when, when, you know, when I came to this country, I was told every day the banking system failed. So I know there's no, no one gonna save me in terms of that. So we're it, mission and money. All the different ways you can become self-made. I'm going to tell you that, I, how many people here have jobs and this is their side hustle? Love it. So I feel like it is not if you're gonna become self-made, it's when. To me, it's the new ticking clock for women. Because we now know we live in a country where everything is happening so fast. Companies are being disrupted. Women, by the time they're 50, get laid off. It's just a fact. Um, and so we all, in order to make it to this, this long life of richness, we have to become self-made. We have to start in a way, and you guys know this because you've already done it, but I'm showing you other ways to become self-made. So the sharing economy, you guys already have that down. I, I, I applaud you because most of the time I have to get women to where you are. I say to women, one hour a week, start selling from your house. Don't leave your job, begin. Because you know once you begin, you get addicted. You know how to do it. You're like, oh my God. But what I do want to tell you is, and I don't know if you guys are doing this, I believe 
all the money you make if it's a side hustle has to be put away. Because you are not completely free to do some of the other things I'm gonna to talk to you about till you have one year of salary saved, never to be touched, and one year of salary to invest. And you do that if you have a job with the side hustle. If your side hustle is your business, then you might have to have some other, you have to then take the money you make in your full-time business and invest it in other ways. And I'll tell you why in a moment. So here are all the ways to become self-made. The first one you have down. You can invent a company, a product, or a technology. I say that's the hardest way to go. That's the 0.1% of people that have that energy to invent something and make it happen. And I say for most of us, that's a mistake. You can disrupt an existing business. There's plenty of people. I've met women out there that they go, OK, what else is out there? There's massage envy. I'm going to create a different kind of massage thing that's my like, secret sauce technique. So you're not inventing something from scratch. You're picking something that already exists, and you're giving it your own spin. Or sometimes you say, you know, I don't need to, I don't need to do it. I don't need to buy anything. Let me go buy a franchise, color by numbers. I think we don't know, we don't realize. I think franchises, like nobody talks about them anymore. And if I had to do my life over again, I would have bought 10 franchises. Because I meet more people that have franchises, and particularly women that have eight franchises, 10 franchises. They make so much money, and it's color by numbers. If you just follow the formula, it works. And we forget that right now there's so many opportunities in the number one up and coming franchises are tutoring for kids. Because our education system is so bad, we need tutors. Yoga, exercise franchises besides food. So there's opportunities and they're looking for women and they're looking for uh, families. So guys, get your wife and you do it as a family and they're looking for you and there's so much money and we'll talk about that in a moment. Buy an existing business. How many of you in your own block have somebody who's older that their kids don't want their business? And you could buy it for a fraction, and you don't have to start from scratch. Or you can create an online brand. Once you get the online thing down, you can become a blogger. You can become all different ways that you can monetize and get advertisers to support you. So there's all these different ways, and we'll talk about it some more. And I'm going to tell you why this is important to start thinking like this. How do you do this? How do you be begin to even incubate? How do you grow your business? How do you grow your existing Etsy business? You can't do this alone. What did I tell you about my own business? I was not doing well, and I realized, I don't know what I'm doing. I need help. Well, the first thing you guys did right was come here and come and learn more. But there's other key players in your team that you have to get. For instance, how many of you have a bank account? OK, how many of you, when you walk into your bank, have a personal banker and have established a relationship with a banker? Good. OK, for those of you who haven't, my game changer, life changer, is that I went into a bank, didn't know what I was doing, and I found a Latina that looked like me. And I'm like, listen because I really didn't know anything about a bank or what, what, did, what did they have or where to put my money. I certainly didn't know anything about lines of credit or that I could borrow money. And I bonded with her because she looked like me. And she changed my life. She's the one that taught me how to take my business and how to take my receivables and get money and how to really maximize my business through my bank. I, I, I finally got a financial advisor. Where, you know, when I had money from my business, even if it was a little, how could I put it somewhere so it could make me interest instead of sitting in the bank? How many of you have a financial advisor? Great. So I want you to think about all these things, because these are things, and these are things that you can trade with people. See, if you all join your local chamber of commerce, you'll know who all these people are. Because all you have to do is get them to vet them for you. And you can even trade with people. You don't even have to pay them when you have a startup business. A tax accountant. My biggest mistake of my life is I didn't have help with taxes. And the first year I made a lot of money, I was like so happy. And at the end of the year, I get the tax bill. And I go, I, I'm in a negative. Oh my god, what, how did this happen? And I didn't realize that my equipment that I was buying and all that, I couldn't write it off all in one year. 
And so I didn't have the right help. I wasn't managing my resources well. A mortgage broker for my mortgage. Like, I have refinanced you know, my buildings and stuff to make money for my business sometimes because the mortgage rates have gone down. Insurance. Do you know how many people I've met that are not properly insured around the country? Women that tell me, I own a little restaurant and the restaurant goes on fire and they lost their entire life savings. Insurance is very important for us. If we have employees, if we start having people that help us, we have to insure, you know, the payroll, everything, that they might fall in our house. Government incentives, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Legal, will, trust. Here we are running a business, but we don't have a, you know, we could drop debt and leave our family debt. Realtor, because I wanna encourage all of you to think about where you work, a live work space that you own. Because sometimes businesses, the property of the business is worth more than the business itself. And then the SBA opportunities in this country, which are in my next slide. So the big takeaway in the book that was what I did, the work I did in my dissertation, the research I did, that shocked me, that brought me to my knees, is that there's hidden money in America for all of us, and we don't apply for it. There's a thing called the Golden Triangle the government, corporations, and nonprofits that have all kinds of money. We're the only country in the world that has this. You want to make America great? Go apply for the money. It's already great, and we're not, you, we're not cap, cap, tapping into this. The Small Business Administration and Government and the Department of Commerce, I bought all those buildings. I didn't use a loan from the Small Business Administration, which practically gives you the building. It's so, it's so inexpensive to get a loan from them. The SBA and the Department of Commerce have more money for women in particular owned businesses, but they don't have money to market it. So you don't know about it. They, this, this year I went and did a deal with them to really put out information about the money they have because only 5% of the money they have women apply for. Unbelievable. Corporations, they have, a, all, all big Fortune 500s have a thing called um, supplier diversity, which means that instead of hiring so many people, they outsource to entrepreneurs' business, whether it's decorating the offices, whether it's tapes, videotapes, whether it's sales teams, whatever it is, they outsource it to entrepreneurs. You have to apply for one of these contracts. A lot of women say to me, well, but I can't fill out that paperwork. It's too much work. Not, there are nonprofits in America that are made to fill the paperwork out for you, and we don't know about it. There are also nonprofits in America that have grants that fund women for their startup businesses, 50,000 to a million. They have it for the guys, too, but women get priority because we're the number one consumers in America and the number one voters in America. Can you believe that? That's amazing. So we go and say, how can I get money? Nobody's giving me money for my business. Well, there's money there that's a grant that you don't have to pay back, that you don't have to give away a percentage of your business. We don't apply for it. And then nonprofits in America also have every kind of training you could ever want for free. So between nonprofits, which by the way, chambers of commerce, most of them are nonprofit, and entrepreneur organizations, we can get all this information. So I, I, I'm coming out with this app in the fall called Becoming Self-Made. It's in English and in Spanish, where every month it'll give you like, ding, ding. These are all the things you can apply for. Because we could not believe the amount of information we found and that nobody has it. So I want you to think about what are the ways you can take your business and grow it. Now, this is the big aha for me. So I had a boss that said to me, you got, you've got to get to the point where you make money while you sleep. So let's go back to that 85-year-old lady and the rich life in every way. I'm going to tell you a shocker. How many of you heard about making money while you sleep? OK, most of you have not. Doesn't shock me. Most people have never heard of this. I had never heard of it. It means. This is it. This is the whole key to the story. The money you make, we always thought the money you make, you save money. That's what's going to take you home for the rest of your life. No way. 
The money you make, you have to save a portion of it. The portion you save, you have to invest. Now, investing it means you guys are investing it in being an Etsy seller, in a business. Whether that business is an actual business that you invest in, whether it's real estate, whether it's stock, whether it's a passive business that you put your kids to work in or your husband. And I say that because women have a better shot of getting and buying a business and getting the loans than men. So again, I tell you guys, partner with a woman if you're smart. It's the era of the woman. So if you are not, this third circle is the key to life that no one tells us. You're not gonna have a rich life in every way if you don't invest in something. So remember what we talked about earlier, that mindset, not short-term gratification, long-term? The secret sauce is the goal is to get to investing in something, being an owner in something. That money while you sleep, that money that I invested in buildings, just so you guys are very clear, my TV life, which sounds very sexy and great, I made five times the money in real estate than in my TV life. That is the money, that investment in real estate is the one that has allowed me to retire, not TV. If I had just done TV, if I had taken the money I saved from TV, I would not have made it to the end of my life. The money I saved from TV that I invested in those buildings took it home for me. And so for you guys, those of you that have a job and you've started, started your side hustle, you need to grow that side hustle and save the money from the side hustle and invest the money from the side hustle. Those of you that the side hustle has become your business, you still have to save money from that business and invest in something else that's gonna make you money while you sleep. Because we all don't wanna to have to work every single minute of the day to make money. Something has to make you money that you don't have to work at. So this is really important. I wanna then ask you, why can, how can we hang in there, not quit, not give up, and make, it, make this rich life in every way? Why is this so important? because I want you all to get to the point where, that you work because you want to and not because you have to. And you don't have to wait till you're 85 to do that. If I could do it in my early 40s, and I'm not Beyonce, I'm not JLo, I'm not an athlete, I'm an immigrant, I started as an intern, I had no education until recently. If I could do it, all of you can do it. I want you to know that at some point in your life, you will be free to completely do anything you want. Because you can, I can. And again, if I can do it, you can do it. I want you to be able to afford healthcare into old age. I'm really afraid for all of us. When I look at my 85-year-old women friends, they have issues with healthcare. And, and, and believe me, you get sick. That seems like lightweight, but it's not. I want you to be able to give yourself whatever gifts you want. If it's to go back to school for yourself like I did, or if it's to buy your house and have it paid off, which I've done. Whatever those big dreams are that make you up. If you wanna go to a spa, I go to a spa every year. So, you know, you will be able, it's not like, you're, oh my God, you're, you're str sacrificing all the time and you won't be able to give back to yourself. You will, but you gotta work hard to get there and that you can sleep at night because you're out of survival mode and you are free. I think that's something we all want, right? Can we all agree we want a rich life in every way? I think so. So I want you to know that you can follow me. My son is my, son is my social media. He tells me I don't know anything about social media. Follow me on what? At Nelly underscore Galan. And you have here the website Becoming Self Made. There is tons of information. There's self-made stories of every kind of woman with every kind of business, webinars, everything. But I want to leave you with some thoughts, which are, why are we doing all this? Why is this so important, whether you're young or you're older? Because we, we are passing the torch of a better way to do a life to our children. We are showing our children people that are truly empowered, not the cliche of empowered, because there is no true empowerment until you have your own money and until you know that you can go get it. And I want you to know that we're doing this because 
I believe that all of us need to become self-made. Again, it's not if, it's when, and you are all already on the road. So I hope you learned the word from my tape, adelante, it's a great word in Spanish. It's like, adelante, it's like, let's get going, let's do it, and I hope all of you become self-made, and I say to you, adelante. I'm gonna leave you with a little tape of my self-made movement. Let's watch. I am self-made. What a powerful thing to be able to say, feel, and accomplish for a woman. I am not alone. There are millions of women around the world becoming financially self-reliant through entrepreneurship. To become self-made is an honor and a new definer for women. And it's not meant to be a grandiose feat. There are no barriers to entry, no excuses. There are tons of entrepreneurial opportunities, and there's hidden money in America for all of us. Self-made is a call to action and a leap forward in the economic evolution of women. Out of necessity, Latinas, African Americans, Asians, Middle East women led the charge as an emerging group that became the fastest growing entrepreneurs, becoming the largest growth engine in this country. So now with them, all women are united in a quest for a financial future we can control. Because there is no true empowerment until you are financially self-reliant, until you have your own money. The new goal is to become self-made. Let me show you how. Now, here, go. Adelante. I am self-made. 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 And you can be too. Nellie, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I hope all of you, all from now on, tell everybody that you are self-made, because you are.